And good morning and good evening, everyone. Thanks for listening in to your host, Tony Lontis, today on Radio Tony. And a big hello to my technician, Revel, and our wonderful guest, Natalie, who I'll be talking to later. So this week at home, we've had some really good winter rain, which is unusual, but much appreciated. Um, I've got two llamas and seven goats at my place, and uh, they don't like winter rain, and they've been spending their days holed up in the shed, snuggled in the hay. The goats in particular don't like wet feet. However, my llamas, avocado and moche, um, have been known to stand out in the pouring rain munching away through our grass. We've also been invaded by big, white, sulphur-crested cockatoos. They're in plague proportions this year, and even though they're pretty iconic to Australia, they're darn noisy big birds. They've been swooping in on my ripening oranges and mandarins and managing to get them through the netting we use to cover the trees. Uh, What they don't get, the goats love to snack on, and my darling goats will do anything to be hand-fed over the electric fence a slice of mandarin or orange. This week, we also managed to crack open the beehive and check on the bees. They were pretty placid this time, and we managed to escape without any bites. We use a smoking machine um, that calms the uh, bees down before we have a look in their hive to check that they're healthy, that they've got enough honey, and that they're pretty happy. Um, We got uh, 16 litres of honey last time we harvested from the hive, and I'm thinking that I might need to drain another couple of litres over the week. Weekend. We have one of those lovely flow hives from the wildly successful Australian inventors who invented the flow hive system, and it allows you to get to the honey without disturbing, disturbing the bees. Unfortunately, you still have to crack the hive open a couple of times a year to check that the bees are healthy and happy and okay. Um, and it's winter here in Australia, as I mentioned before, and it's been one of our worst flu seasons seasons ever and you guessed it I have a particularly nasty lurgy not only have I had aches and pains and cold and flu but a hacking cough a sore throat and completely blocked ears and the pain from my blocked ears has been intense so I just thought I'd tell our listeners what causes that pain in your blocked ears that pain that brings you to tears in the middle of the night. So the pain in in your ears is caused by a fluid buildup behind your eardrums. And the proper name for your eardrum is, of course, the tympatic membrane. And the outer ear, the ear that the world sees, and the inner ear are connected uh, by eustachian tubes and divided by these eardrums. So what happens when you have a bad cold or flu is that fluid builds up in those little tubes behind the eardrum and the pressure or the infection pushes on the eardrums causing that intense pain so you'll be pleased to know that overnight my eardrums busted and now I can actually hear which I was a bit worried about yesterday I have to tell you that I had a brief conversation with my wonderful guest who suggested I try an old ginger lemon tea. And having tried that, I feel much better and I've got a pot of tea brewed beside me to get me through the show today. So uh, apologies in advance for uh, intermittent coughing or a hoarse throat. Um, And... I'm really happy to be here anyway. So one of my lovely listeners says, what lovely animals you have on hand. Yes, I must say that my seven goats, and they all have names, and my two llamas, my two dogs, and my seven ducks and three chickens all bring calm into my life and help me uh, remain happy, peaceful, and ready to get on with the world. So before we get into world news, if just a quick reminder for you to pop onto my website, tonylontis.com, T-O-N-I-L-O-N-T-I-S.com, to see what I've been up to, find the latest podcasts of this show, my blogs, and can 
you can contact me directly. I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to know your thoughts and ideas. I'd love to engage with the listeners of this show. And you can also contact me via social media on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. My email address is Tony Lontis Author, T O N I L O N T I S A U T H O R, at gmail.com. And I thought this week before we got onto world news that I'd start with some good news and a wonderful good news story out of the US. When a girl by the name of Mary Lathan's mother died in 2013, uh, the New York wedding photographer went several years of feeling rather adrift, wondering how uh, her emotions could remain so raw after the loss of her mother. Her mind would routinely go back to something her mum Patricia Latham, had told her after the Sandy Hook Mass School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, in 2012. I've been feeling terribly sad about it, she said. Mary, there are always going to be tragedies in the world, but there will always be more good. You just have to look for it. Um, it took almost three years for Mary to truly understand what her mother Patricia meant. To honour her mum's legacy of looking for goodness in the world, she came up with a plan. She would pack a suitcase with several changes of clothes and hit the road in her mum's blue Subaru Outback to drive cross-country in search of simple acts of kindness. Lathan decided to call her road trip Project More Good and document all the stops on her website with the goal of publishing a book to donate to hospital waiting rooms coast to coast. On October 2016, she set out in a blue, um, in her old blue car from her family's home on Long Island, taking along dozens of more good T-shirts to hand out to people who followed her journey online and agreed to host her for two or three nights. She also packed the back of the car with a camera and several notebooks, plenty of water and snacks, a blanket, candles, flash night, and a flashlight, joking that she wanted to be prepared in case there was a blizzard in Maine. Almost three years later, other than the occasional weekend flights home to Long Island to photograph weddings and replenish her funds and her energy, Latham is still at it, with only seven more states to go on a trip, including Alaska and Hawaii. For those states, she's hoping to rent a blue Subaru rather than ship her car to Hawaii or spends or spend weeks alone in the wilds of Alaska. Mary said, my mum would be impressed. I've already put 38,000 miles on the odometer, she said, and has, she'd stayed with about 140 families, mainly in small towns along America's back roads. People who follow her journey on her website invite her to stay in their guest rooms or refer her to people to interview in their communities to brighten others' lives. I spend a lot of alone time in my car and it can get loady, lonely, said Mary. So to stay with people and have a home-cooked meal and hear their stories of kindness provides a big boost for me. I haven't had a single bad in- experience in any of them. From a most recent stop in Connecticut on her latest stay in the Cincinnati area, Mary has collected hundreds of do-good stories along the way. In Rhode Island, a bank teller told her about the time she had a bad day at work and a customer asked if she was okay. When the teller said she'd be fine if she ate M&Ms after work, the customer bought a bag of candies and returned to slip them under the bank teller's window um, as she went about her bank duties. In Indiana, she met a woman who had a traumatic childhood and now takes dozens of foster children in with special needs. She hopes to provide them with happiness that she never experienced. Among her most memorable experiences was a stay in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, minus the blizzard, of course, in a 100-year-old farmhouse. This woman reached out to, to me reached out to me on Facebook and when I looked at her photo I thought this could be the nicest woman in the world or a serial killer. Her photo showed her riding a bike with a puppy in the basket. Latham was delighted and relieved when she arrived to smell the aroma of freshly baked blueberry muffins drifting through the front screen door. 
She pushed the door open and instantly was smacked with this warmth. There was a wood stove burning and a puppy from the basket ran out to greet me and the woman hosting me gave me a big hug. Although we were strangers, we sat and we talked like old friends for hours. She had similar experiences with families in Indiana who fixed her flat tyre and then put her up for three nights and a man who recently had a double lung transplant and who left $20 in her backpack. Some of her hosts are now her friends and she's been thrilled at the amount of people who've opened their home up and provided stories for her on her journey. She's staying with people she's never met and offering herself to tell people stories of loss, tragedy and hardship. She knows it's taking a toll on her body, but she remains determined to complete her goal. And that's my good news story for this week. Over to world news. And in Germany, distressing footage has emerged of German leader Angela Merkel's health. as She's been seen violently shaking for a second time this month. According to news.com, there are fears over the health of the German chancellor. Um, and it's feared that she may be suffering an unknown illness. Nobody's commenting at the moment. In the latest on Bitcoin... Bitcoin. There is one Bitcoin worth an apparent $19,000. And although the Bitcoin bubble has well and truly burst, it is seeing a 17-month high at the moment. It means Bitcoin has now taken the cumulative month-to-date gains to 50% and is tipped to record double-digit gains for the third straight month. And across to India, at least 21 cities in India are expected to run out of groundwater by 2020, with 100 million people affected. 40% of India's population would have no access to drinking water by 2030. Three rivers, four water bodies, five wetlands and six forests have completely dried despite having better resources and more rains than any other metro cities. Climate change is being blamed for the water crisis. Across to America, where uh, America's next presidential election, even though it's 17 months away, the campaign's officially started. Um, The first Democratic Party's uh, national debate has been hosted by NBC News with 10 candidates appearing and a further 10 to appear. All of them want to take on Donald Trump in the general election and it seems the president was watching, but he didn't find it particularly stimulating, apparently. Across to Canada, where the means of combating plastic pollution, uh, Canada moves to ban dozens of single-use plastics by 2021. What a wonderful initiative. The Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced in a speech that he and his government are planning on phasing out several forms of common plastic waste, such as water bottles, single-use bags, coffee cups, coffee cup lids and straws. Also in Canada, they recently passed legislation that bans keeping whales and dolphins and porpoises in captivity for entertainment, trade, possession, capture or breeding. The Bill S203 is also known for the ending of captivity of whales and dolphins. Over to Scotland, where the government has announced that they are planting national trees at a record amount, with over 22 million trees being planted by 2018. The new trees amount to roughly 43 square miles of new forestry added in 2018 alone. And I apologise for my delightful puppies barking out of turn today. I will get to them in a moment. So... It's now time for us to pop over to a quick break and when I return, we'll be on with Natalia Rostockian. Over to you, Rebel. And welcome back. 
I'm sorry for our interruptions today. My puppies have decided that there's someone unexpected visiting our front door. Um, so we have the most amazing guest online with us today. Natalie Rostockian is a great granddaughter of Romanian genocide survivors and she was born and raised in Lebanon. She left Lebanon to marry a Canadian man and has spent the last few years writing her first novel called Masks. Nat Natalie's experience includes nearly 20 decades of journalism and TV um, as an actress, a live TV show host and a radio host in Lebanese and Arabic society. She rose through the ranks and... Um, lived a life in glamour circles with celebrities and even having her own TV show. But she considered she was living a dark life um, until she met someone oceans apart and decided to leave her whole life and follow her heart to Canada. Today, Natalie is a housewife um, and is writing another book. And I'm so excited to have Natalie on the show with us today. How are you? Thank you very much, Tony, for this wonderful introduction. It's amazing. I just want to ask you, first of all, how are you doing today? And um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so glad that your tea was helpful. I've got a cup beside me that I'm trying to sip on in between breaths. And um, I know that you have uh, are wonderful to talk to. So I'm hoping that you will fill in the gaps when um, my voice gets too hoarse. So, Natalie, um, and then Natalie, I'm, I'm sorry, my, uh, my brain is um, a little... <laughs> It's okay. Don't worry well. about it. It's it's the flu. So I just want to say hi to all the listeners in Australia and United States, Canada, all around the world. But I want to tell them that this is my first interview with a wonderful and the most amazing um, author, Tony. That I read her book and it was quite impressive and I know that we have a lot in common you and I and we that's do. why I think that we clicked from the moment that we read each other's books and yes. that was amazing and I read yes. it in in the plane while I was going back to Lebanon and I think that uh, it's so funny how we think that we are so different when it comes to culture where we are raised but we don't know how much more we have in common when it comes to us as women because we do and if women were not the perfection god would have stopped with adam i think so i think yeah <laughs> that's yes, why he just <laughs> agreed yeah. natalie I find that women across many different um, cultures and countries have so much in common. And I was particularly drawn to your um, book, Masks. And I'm just wondering, first off, how about we get you to tell our listeners about your book and then we'll get into your life and life story. What do you think? Okay. Let's um, tell the listeners about your wonderful book, masks well i hope they will find interesting the book the book masks it is based on true life events and yes. uh, uh it's a dark fictional tale but it is based on real life events yes. and masks is about a girl who is named anna uh, that has dreamed from an early age of fame and power in the arab world risking her family's disapproval while yeah. navigating a world of social, religious, and sexual taboos, she forges a lonely path toward fame. Struggling against those cultural chains, she builds a successful career alongside royalty, celebrities, and glitterati, and spares nothing to attain her goals. So Anna not only... Anna's family not only survived the Armenian genocide, but her yes. personal history as a rape survivor and witness to the Lebanese civil war has left a void in her heart that she tries to fill this uh, void and this uh, yeah. 
thing that she has been suffering from with uh, many sexual adventures yes. filled with anger and uh, desperation when we you know when we are in a dark place and stuck that's what she, Anna is suffering from uh, yeah. in the book masks and she lives in a world where a girl is worth only her virginity where women do not dare to ask for a divorce and yeah. where the fear of retribution keeps them locked in a cage that is gilded when yeah. um, fame, money, and power take their toll. In the story, you can uh, realize that Anna falls in love with a stranger from Quebec. And it's a little bit erotic, the story, but you will realize that it doesn't it talk is. about erotic things only because it just uh, tries to make the reader understand and to explain what, why Anna is doing those things, those immoral things, why she's getting lost, because it is not that I'm, I'm trying to uh, justify her deeds, but I'm trying to explain that uh, what happens when somebody is stuck and lost and her dream becomes a nightmare. And, uh, well, she gets uh, a night of secret passion with a stranger from Quebec, yes. so just yes. like me with my husband. Yes. So here... Her many words clash and she tries to be happy and she doesn't know what she has to do. And probably she has to sacrifice everything that she has worked for in order to be with this man. On the other side, uh, she has a lover, she has a husband, she has this um, uh, responsibility as a public figure and yes. everything going on in, his, uh, in her life. So the struggle between her own demons and everything, it just shows the reader that women, how we are urged to wear masks. And I think yes. that we have to remove the masks. So yeah. the story, it's about, it is erotic in a way, and uh, but at the same time, it talks does, about... Yes, go ahead. Natalie, does, is the book loosely or closely based on your own life it is closely based on my life yeah. and uh, it is inspired by uh, my life events and uh, somebody is saying that how can we overcome our own demons yeah. uh, i just i don't know i'm very bad in technology i um, i belong to the old school so tony yes. and rebel thank you very much for both of you and my warm regards to Rebel too. I'm trying to. Uh, She's fabulous, okay. isn't she? <laughs> yes, she is. I just got the question here about the demons. I think that to overcome our own demons, it's very hard because it took me it over uh, 20 years to yeah. overcome my own demons. And it is very hard because once I started to overcome my demons, it means that I started to say out loud all the faults, all the mistakes that I have done in my life. And yeah. I started to confess them. And it was very hard because then in the at the beginning, it is so hard because you will see that a lot of people will be disappointed in you because they will prefer to see you with a mask on and to go on with your life with the taboos and all the secrets just like them so yeah. to overcome your own demons uh, you have to have the courage to say that I did a mistake and I'm okay with that mm. and I ask for your forgiveness and I ask for my husband's forgiveness I confess everything I said there are things not only that I have done in my life that experiences experiences that I have been through. Also, I have seen things that it's like very scary. So I think that to overcome your own demons, it's to be yourself because I think that everybody else out there is taken. So be yourself. I don't think that you're going to be loved for from everyone, but I think that you'll be amazed at how much people will start embracing you. And those people are the people that will love you for your true self. It's hard, yeah. I'm telling you. I mean, it's been hard. A lot of people ask me a lot of questions. And when I was uh, uh, first uh, having my first interview, one of my first interviews, uh, the, the first question was like, have you ever been sexually assaulted? And yeah. it's very hard for me to answer that question coming from somewhere that we are very careful to speak about uh, those things. Because for us, it's a secret. It's a shame. And uh, I think that no public figure, a female public figure before had ever said or uh, talked about that who came from Lebanon and the Arab wow. world. But I'm not going to be the last. I'm starting this idea because I think that it's, start, it's time to stand up. And that's the first step 
to overcome yes. our demons. It's scary. And, and to say, yes, I had a sexual assault. I had been through some things that I shouldn't have done. I had done mistakes because yes. I chose to do them, not because I'm not a victim. I chose some of them. It but was hard. Also, <laughs> also remembering that you're not in, at fault in um, a, a sexual assault. It, a sexual assault is not something that a woman controls, um, is it? Well, where we come from, it is not analyzed so because yeah. um, they will just start questioning women more than questioning men. I mean, you are not a victim as a woman. So the questions will start, what did you do in order to make that person make an approach and do that assault oh, to you. Wow. So, yeah, it's very scary. And uh, a lot of people just hide it. And I hid it my whole life. I mean, I just started writing this novel. And believe me, I don't know if, um, I don't know if it's, um, it's not funny. But in a way, while I was writing, I was crying. Yeah. And when yes. I was trying to reread it before sending yeah. it to my editor, David Antropos. I say hi to him also. It was very sad because I was just as if I was leaving the moment and there are still yeah. a lot to write and I'm writing in my second novel. Yes. But uh, the novel just shows to people that we women are the same everywhere, but it will open a new door to the West to see the Middle East, to see Lebanon, to see the Arab world, to see the female public figures over there, yeah. how much we suffer, uh, but we try to, I don't know, to keep it inside and yes. we choose to suffer and cry alone and we don't say anything out loud because we will be persecuted, we, we will be in shame, you know, and, and if I wasn't here in Canada, I think that I would have been, I would have just continued doing my TV show and everything, etc., cetera, et cetera, and I wouldn't been able to write and be here. So I think that it might be for a reason. I don't know. I, I was just going to say, so um, you are known in Lebanon um, as having spoken out. Um, do you think that things are changing or there still has a long way to go in Lebanon uh, where women are concerned? They are trying to make some uh, organizations to help women yes. and uh, nowadays, but still everything for them is different because uh, Lebanon is the most um, open-minded country in the Middle East when it comes to uh, fashion. Yes. And we're, we're very open-minded when you see our uh, TV shows, when you see how we speak, how open-minded, yes. our parties, nightclubs, everything. It's so glamorous. It's so like, yes. you're like in Europe. It's Europe of the Middle East, Lebanon. But when yes. it comes to women's rights, and even when it comes to the right of anybody who has, uh, who chooses a certain sexual lifestyle, we yes. have a long way to go because it's about the the confession. It's like Scarlet's letter. It's like y yes. you have something on your forehead written. You are divorced. You are raped. You are this. You are that. And and that is something that people do not approach you with an understanding. They approach yes. you because the society is condemning, condemn, uh, trying to condemn you and trying to persecute you more than uh, yes. the religion itself. And yeah. it's very hard, but it's better than before. But uh, yeah. till today, no female figure had been on television or wrote anything or said that she had done many wrong things in order to reach where she had to. Not because she yeah. doesn't want to say, because yeah. we are scared. We, we do not have a choice because we have to wear masks. And that's why I wrote the book Masks. That's why you call it start. Masks. Yeah. Exactly, because I want to remove the masks. And uh, I want to tell to them that to all women out there who are listening to us now yes. that yes. our social, sexual and religious taboos are dictating us. And yes. they are rules. And they are urging us to wear a mask yeah. and repressing our strength, our courage, our passion. I ask them and I say, please. Try to emerge from the crowd. Surround yourself with the few. It's okay if there are a few people, but they will know your true face. And when yeah. you remove your mask, you will suffer at the beginning. 
Yeah. And I suffer a lot and I'm still suffering because people ask all kind of questions and even yeah. my family, I mean, they did not approve with what I did and they still don't. But that's okay because I think that it, it's a chance hard. for true happiness is to remove it, the mask and be courageous. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is so hard to live with family disapproval, isn't it, Natalia? Yes, it is. I yes, struggle. it is. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. And, and the worst, and the worst part is that we just try to do our best to um, to get their attention and to get to please them, to make them yeah. proud of us. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, it's like as if they want everything to be their point of view and their rules and their um, way that they see, the way that they see ethics and values. I do respect families and I think that they raised us, but I think that each one of us, we should have our own voice and we are not leaders, we are women and we should be ourselves and we should be free to be who we are. And, and if you wouldn't have written that story, if I had not written masks, I mean, How will other women come forward and talk about their own problems? We have to start. We have to make out. it. We have to make it okay for women to talk about exactly tough subjects, especially there, because here they speak. They speak in the United States. They speak in Canada, but yep. over there, they don't come forth and they don't uh-huh. speak. And uh, me, even writing a book. It, it was a very big, uh, like, scandal more than, like, uh, a praise wow. or, yes. And uh, it wasn't well uh, accepted by the family. But I think that as long as I have the love of my husband and yes. my cousins, my friends, people who really believe in me, and yeah. uh, I try to believe in myself because uh, yeah. you have to have that confidence. But I think that the spice of that confidence is the family And it's like they are the salt, you know, the family members. But we get used to live without the spices or without the salt, like if we have some kind of disease. And it's okay just to eat without the spice, the meat, the steak. So for me, it's uh, better to choose to be myself rather than uh, getting the approval and the applause of people that do not really know us who had been yeah. with us our whole li- uh, lives. And that's very sad, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I really would like to know about growing up in Lebanon and and what your life was like before you became that high profile, a TV personality. So tell our listeners about growing up in Lebanon. Uh, growing up in Lebanon, it's a little bit different for me when it comes uh, to my culture because though I was born in Lebanon, I'm Armenian, yes. so Arabic yes. is not my first language. Arabic yes. is my third language. So yeah. as our um, Armenian community, we go to our Armenian schools and we study uh, the program of Armenia, and at the same yeah. time we study the program of Lebanon. So as if uh-huh. we're doing double programs. So, And the accent is different. So when we speak Arabic, it's not the same as they do because it's a very hard language. It's a beautiful language, but it's very yeah. different from Armenian. Yeah. So, um, and um, I was like always uh, surrounded by Armenians. I didn't know what it meant uh, to be in the Lebanese society and to speak Arabic openly uh, until I was like 14 because I only spoke Arabic at school when we had, you know, to do our lessons. But uh, beside that, our all, the whole family, the relatives, everybody Armenian. So my father was on Armenian stage theater. So I always wanted to be an actress. I, w- oh. I always dreamt. And, uh, and that's where my um, dream started. And uh, right. I went to a radio station, Armenian radio station. I was 12 years old and I was reciting a poem and I said I want to become a speaker and I pushed myself on them it's very funny and yeah. little by little they gave me small segments to speak every Sunday and, yes. and I think I was the youngest uh, radio host uh, at the time and the radio was Radio Van at the si- at, till today it still exists yes. the radio station and uh, my best regards to them and after yeah. that I just went to my um, father's um, um, theater group and acted 
Shakespeare, yeah. uh, Trees of Verona and Chekhov and a classical uh, theater. It yeah. was a very beautiful experience, but I knew that I should not stop there. But yeah. my family and the surrounding was uh, different. So I had to choose to study, go to the university and teach so I used to teach math, science, and English till 21, till yes. I decided to be free and yes. to make a choice. And in that particular strategy came along a baggage of being married to someone who was like my first husband. And uh -huh. in a way, I was in love with him, of course. And at the same time, I was just planning to have a life that freedom to make my own choices. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I wouldn't have been uh, reaching there. I could not be able to do anything except if I'm married and have my own house. And that's was it where I struggled again. No, no, no. We, we don't have no. uh, marriages like that. He was like my okay. boyfriend. We go out. We we don't because we as Armenian Christians, we are very open minded people. Most yes. of us. I yes. mean, uh, we do not come from that community. But yes. when it comes like uh, to marriage, they prefer to marry Armenians to each other, yes. and mm -hmm. uh, because we say that we survived the genocide, uh, yes. our grandfather, so we have to uh, multiply. So I don't think they want to multiply more of me, Natalia Restokian. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't. don't say that. You're unique. <laughs> the world you. needs more Natalis across I everywhere, so. speaking out and <laughs> saying their truth, don't they? I don't know. Uh, I hope um, when they read the book, they will decide. But, I know uh, so. Yeah. I know so. You. The world needs more of you, definitely. So at 21, you stopped yeah. teaching, and then what happened? And then I went to a um, modeling agency, and I oh. started photo modeling. And at the time, yes. it was very hard because I was making no money, and yeah. uh, I decided to move in with my husband to my family's, to my parents' house yeah. because I wasn't making money. And I was running from one casting place to another to do TV shows. And mm -hmm. I had the accent in Arabic in, in, and the Armenian accent in yes. my Arabic language. But I don't know. I mean, uh, they saw my picture, one of... Uh, the uh, uh, producers and uh, the first TV series was on TL television and mm -hmm. uh, Tele Liban, they say. And from there, I just got other TV shows one by one, one by one. But it was hard because uh, the payment was not good at the beginning. And then mm -hmm. I moved to becoming a marketing manager of uh, three economic magazines. And I started traveling all around the world, attending conferences for uh, Arab businessmen and politicians and then um, I became um, agent for two singers which was a very hard uh -huh. thing for me and I failed in that I, I wasn't good that I felt I totally failed as an agent that wasn't my oh. thing <laughs> and then uh, you I you failed I failed because uh, it had it wasn't my thing to to control and to take care of singers, to promote them, because yes. it's more than we see on the screen. It yes. has more things. I mean, how could I say masks? You have, there are a lot of masks that yes. they wear and a lot of things going on, going on behind curtains that you have to be responsible for. And mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't ready. And I didn't have the strength and I wasn't responsible enough. And I realized that it wasn't my passion and uh, I just let it go. I realized that I failed and I stopped that. And then I got a chance to have my own TV show. And uh, till the day I came to Canada, I was still doing my TV show. I mean, I flew to Canada on Monday, my last TV episode was uh, on television Sunday night and wow. yeah and uh, and all, all all my fans I came by the Jordanian Airlines they were yes. waiting for me in Jordan uh, it was amazing uh, at the airport yes. and uh, my they knew because I said on television I'm coming um, I'm going to uh, to Canada with my new husband and yeah. by Jordanian Airlines and it was very funny because when we were sitting there at the airport and they were calling my name. I said to oh. my husband, they're calling my name. He's like, seriously, you get to get over this. I said, they're calling my name. Seriously, honey, you have to get over this. Mm -hmm. And it was a third time. It was seriously my name. They're calling Natalie Restokian. And yeah. 
I went to one of the officers over there and I said, they're calling my name. And there were people waiting downstairs with flowers, bouquet of flowers. I mean, more than, I don't know how many, like yeah. 80, 90 people. They were there yeah. that, who watched my show. They just wanted to say hi. And I didn't have a visa to go, but uh, some one of the officers came down with me and yeah. I went over there. I took pictures with them. It was amazing. And oh. it was, yeah. That part, my fans, amazing. I mean, they they made me who I was. They helped yeah. me, and I yeah. thank them. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell our listeners what your TV show was about? Yeah, my first TV show, uh, if I translate it to English, it's named yeah. uh, "How Are You," and uh-huh. uh, it's 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 about how are you because every time I take a, a specific subject and I talk about that specific subject which is very um, as a taboo let's say rape yes, yes and I talk about rape I do the research and and I get online with somebody on the phone to speak or come as a guest but yes. we don't show the face of the person of course because yes. it's not yes. uh, acceptable over there to talk about rape for example adoption somebody who has been adopted what they went through this is this was my first show and yeah. it lasted for two years and the second show was uh, uh called from everything and everyone let's say yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the translation is like min jamiru, they say it's like from everything so a yeah. uh, little bit of everything it was yes. about uh, me uh criticizing and uh uh, realizing the taboos of the singers or the actresses, the actors, uh, two sides. I mean, things that happen to them yeah. as scandals. And on the other hand, uh, things that happen to them and they were blamed for. So each time I brought somebody or uh, brought up the subjects and had guests that had been into trouble, sometimes I had to criticize other TV shows. And it oh. was funny. Because I had a lot yeah. of enemies. My my car um, was cr- crashed and oh. I had a lot of stress from people. Some, <laughs> yeah, it happened like that. But for us, wow. it's normal. <laughs> yes, but it was okay because sometimes uh, you have to be the voice when you're in journalism. And yes. I just think that you ha- you really have to have the voice, not only to talk about fairy tales, because yes. you also have to talk about the truth. And um I was able to do that in some ways and uh, because a lot of uh, bad things had happened to people that yes. shouldn't have and uh, people who even uh, did shows like Star Academy or The Voice and yeah. they were misjudged, mistreated. So I invited them over. They talked about what happened to them and we got calls from their fans and uh, yeah. it was it was very... Um, gratifying to see them say out loud what they really yeah. feel and to be yeah. their voice yeah. and that was my second show till I left everything behind oh. and fell in love still in love yes <laughs> yes yes yeah. yes are you glad that you made that decision to leave Lebanon and go to Canada yes totally because yeah. uh uh, it's not about leaving Lebanon because when I married to my husband, my yeah. uh, husband in Canada, I asked him to stay in Lebanon and yeah. I said, I will provide everything for you. I work and you stay here. Yeah. He did not accept it. He said that I'm the man. I should be the one who's providing and I yes. don't want your money. Yeah. So uh, in order anyway to get a fast divorce, I had to sign some papers and uh, to get a divorce, a fast divorce, uh, I became a Syrian on the papers. Uh-huh. It's another Christian sect, me and my ex-husband. Yeah. So I yeah. had to give up a lot of things financially in order to get my freedom. Yeah. And uh, and somebody is saying, oh, will you open my eyes on things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this book about someone she knew? And they're asking me another question. Yes. yes. Uh, it's about... Uh, m- you, you, when you read the book, you will know that it's about me and also about uh, a lot of other women that I merged the voices. And it's not all, it's all, not only about me because I couldn't just create more than now uh, um, twenty characters. So I merged some stories in the characters in the protagonist Anna, some of them in other characters, in order to make it more comfortable for the reader, in order not to make them get yes. lost. Yes. And uh, I think that um, 
it is very important to know that uh, I didn't, I, I'm not happy that I left Lebanon. I love Lebanon. Yes. Uh, it's where I was born and it gave me my identity. And of course, I love Armenia because this is, that's where I've come from, my, my yeah. grandfather, the land of my grandfather. But uh, I think that I have to thank Canada for this opportunity that gave me to yeah. become an author. But I yes. am happy for one thing, choosing my husband. And if I yes. go back in time, I would choose him back. And I think that in life, everything comes with a price. And I couldn't have it all. But yeah. it, it, it proves to everybody. And it's in my book. I don't want to tell them the whole yeah. story. But it, it just tells to, them that, um, yes. We're going to have to go to a little quick break. Um, and when we come back, I want to talk a bit more about um, Lebanon. Um, and um, over to you, Rebel, and our listeners will be back after the break. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are talking to the delightful Natalia Rostovigan, the oh, – and I've messed up her glorious name. Natalia, can you tell the listeners your last name and the meaning behind your last name? Well, <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that yesterday. My family name is Restokian, but mm -hmm. um, it is not Restokian uh, because the real family name is Hreshtakian. Hreshtakian comes from the word Hreshtag. Hreshtag in Armenian means angel. So I'm not an angel at all. I'm the opposite, of course. It doesn't fit <laughs> to be my family yeah. name, I think. But uh, when my grandpa came, uh, he was survived, he survived the genocide and he came uh, from the desert, Derzor. It seems that he was very young and they registered, <laughs> like most family names, um, wrong in uh, the language because it was a totally different language, the Arabic and the Armenian. And uh, yeah. it is told that my grandpa, uh, during the genocide, had seen in his uh, in his um, dream yeah. an angel because uh while they were just being uh, taken out from their homes and driven into the desert uh, they lost each other on their ways and he had 11 sisters and his mother and his mother uh threw himself into a well into a i don't know it, it's like um a very uh, it's a well of water and uh, yes. i think that yes. uh, they just kept on walking and he was crying. He was six years old. Yeah. And um, that night they slept, of course, in the desert because they survived only eating the grass and anything they uh, found and wow. the dirt from uh, the horses of the soldiers. And they hid the dead people that were with oh. them and they survived on the flesh of the dead people. Oh. And uh, and in his, in his dream, uh, the... He was crying because he was the youngest and he wasn't the only son. And uh, the, the angel appeared and told him that uh, don't cry because tomorrow your mother is going to come back. So yeah. uh, and, and next day, I mean, they're in the desert, you know, on the sand. And he's like, my mother is coming. And, uh, and the sister says, stop saying that. Stop saying that. And um, every couple of hours, new groups were coming and uniting them because it was the first world war. And this world... Uh, during the war, they were just making an excuse, the Ottoman Empire, to uh, vanish the Armenians. Um, mm. And um, so within these groups, one of these groups, he found his mother. And it was mm. very shocking. But it was because she threw herself into the well, into the well and yeah. she couldn't be surviving. And yeah. uh, But it seems that before her, there were other people over there who had been killed down there and there was no water left for her to suffocate or to die. So mm -hmm. she kept on shouting all night long and the soldiers just took her out. It's a very uh, distressful story, but I heard it from my father and from my mm -hmm. uh, aunts and uh, we tell it from one generation to the other mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for the memory to stay alive. And uh, But she just survived a couple of days because she was so scared. It seems that something happened in her body that she was poisoned there and she oh. died. And, uh, oh, and my, no. yeah, and, and, and my grandpa and only one sister survived. The rest all were raped and killed. And uh, that's why when my aunts were born in Lebanon, uh, he called three of my aunts the names of uh, his sister who 
had died and martyred, I could say, in 1915, the genocide of 1.5 million Armenians yes. by the Ottoman Empire. So um, that's the story. It's, it's not something that we often talk about in Western society is the genocide of the Armenian um, people. And it's probably something that, that we should. It would have been a terrible time for your people and your family. And I'm, I'm so glad that they survived because now we have you um, on the planet. Um, so I wanted to explore um, what living in Lebanon is uh, in terms of being a woman so that our listeners mm. can understand yeah. some of the restrictions that mm. you have, particularly around yeah. um, sexual taboos and um and that. So, can you tell yeah. our listeners about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, they have to know that we have different societies in Lebanon, and yes. having Muslims and Christians, we have uh, a very um, open-minded um, yes. society when it comes to the Christians. Some of them, uh, we follow everything which is related to fashion and plastic yes. surgeries, especially when we are public figures, but nowadays, yeah. I mean, mostly everyone, and we have this conservative uh, Muslims who just wear the hijab, and uh, uh, those are uh, the ones who are, like, uh, strictly very, like, uh, some of them are very strictly, like, very religious, and yeah. some of them still Muslim, but they are open-minded to some levels. Yeah. So we have different societies at the, in the same country living together. And uh, when it comes to being a housewife or being uh, a female celebrity, it's yeah. all the same. I mean, yeah. uh, f to give an, an example, for example, I mean, I've been here in Canada for 11 years. And a uh, couple of years ago, I was sitting down with uh, friends of my husband and they're all yeah. married, and uh, and they were all talking with each other. I'm giving just an example about people who just moved out of Lebanon mm. and are living in Canada, and yeah. they're Canadians, and their children are born here. So, And mm. they're talking about the wives, and they're saying like, oh, I, I tried to kiss my wife and uh, when I was engaged, but it's good that she didn't kiss me back, because if she did, I would have not married her and the other one said oh i'm happy that i am the first one to be with her and she was a virgin of course mm -hmm. i would not have not accepted that so when it comes to women it's forbidden there are things forbidden and and they related yeah. to ethics but for mm -hmm. men everything is like permitted okay. for example when a man marries in lebanon they yeah. can uh, even if they can have easily a divorce or they, if they go out and uh, they betray the wife, um, they could be called like a womanizer. Yeah. But when a woman goes out and makes a mistake, they call her a prostitute. Uh -huh. So so it's permitted. I mean, Double okay, standards. you say that you're a male and you're a female, it's fine. I'm not saying that it's it has to be permitted for female. I'm not encouraging that. I mean, I... I had somebody I was in love with when I was married, and yeah. I married him, the yeah. one that I was in love. I'm not justifying my mm, mistake, yeah. but yeah. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, we shouldn't be judged. And I think that the equality comes like we are human beings before being women. So they mm -hmm. don't look at us like that. Imagine you can go out with someone have fun etc etc and you can see till today women over there girls young girls in their 20s who are educated they are just graduating universities and they are on television or yeah. they have very important posts in uh, society uh, but but the thing is that uh, the thing is that they go and have surgeries most of them before yeah. marriage in order to prove to the husband that they are virgins they base wow. their their marriage on lies. And I'm not talking about the ones who are wearing hijabs. I'm talking about the open-minded people. I mean, when I was sitting, for example, at this during this conversation when we were just gathered with friends, everybody like saying, oh, I met this my wife like this. She was walking with her friends, etc. And, and how did you meet your husband? And they asked me. I said, oh, my husband was my lover. And everybody was silent. <laughs> Nobody yeah. said a word. <laughs> because yeah. for them, it's a shock. For me, it's a shock. But... When I say out loud, they now they love me, they embrace me, they are part of my, I mean, everyday life, 
I yeah. love my friends and they accept me for who I am because who am I to judge others? Who are they mm. to judge me? Because they are not in my shoe. I'm not saying that I didn't do a mistake, but yeah. I, you cannot live with your mistake, blaming, blaming yourself. And that mistake that you had done in your past or the choice that you have been in love or you yeah. did a mistake, it should not, um, I mean, symbolize it or it, it, should, it should, should determine not, your life going exactly. forward should it your present or it, it should not define you who you are today and you should not base your your life or your future on the fear of your past yeah and uh that's how i just knew who accepts me and who doesn't so yeah. uh and they did and i'm happy and uh i'm happy i mean i have some conflicts a lot of times, yes. I'm telling you, I, between now and then, I get very emotional, uh, yeah. especially when I'm watching something. When uh, people like I, I, I talk with my husband, oh, how we met, how you hugged me, how I felt safe yeah. in your arms. It's all in the yeah. book. I'm not going to tell you guys the story. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's like it's even I named the character that Anna was in love with Joe because yes. it's like Saint Joseph, you know, like the yes. story of. Bible. Yes. I'm not so religious. I just uh, recently started believing more. And yeah. uh, but uh, 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 I'm a sinner. But I'm I believe in Jesus the Christ. And yeah. uh, and 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 I think that the redemption comes when somebody is there to understand you. We cannot do that alone. So in order yeah. to stand up and to do it in Lebanon, I mean, they, we have to start somewhere. And it's not going to start easily. I mean, when you just Think about the United States or Australia, how women had been through a lot for even for voting. I mean, 200 yes. years ago, right? I mean, yes. and these things happen everywhere. And it's something that is happening everywhere around the world. But, yeah. but over there, it's like we are, it, we have a fear. Bit behind. We have fear. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, 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 and we don't have the law by our side. I mean, if, if let's yes. say you are raped and you have a child in Lebanon, yes. okay, you're yes. raped and you get pregnant, you decide yes. not yes. To, have, to have abortion and the child is born. You have no right to put that child under your name. The child will be written in the ID, in the ID I mean, in the passport, yeah. like unknown. A long oh. time ago, a couple of years ago, they used to write bastard the word bastard now they change it to unknown <gasps> yeah but when a man makes a, a woman pregnant yeah it's okay they can just put it under his name so women cannot even give their family name to the child and the child oh. is like an orphan how can this child be accepted by the society what kind of psychology what kind of mental yes. state will have this child growing up yeah. in a society when in his or her own ID or passport, the family yeah. name is unknown. I yeah. mean, do you understand to what limits we're going to? And this is yeah. like ruining uh, the society. Yeah. It has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with ethics. It has to do with our morals, our conscience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You shot, That's right? So now you really have a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> That's really sad. Now I know that you go back. Uh, all of your family is in Lebanon. I understand. Yeah, I have no one here. Yeah, you, I'm all yeah. alone. Just, mm -hmm. just husband. Um, so what happens when you return to Lebanon? Mm. Well, you have to be more specific in your question, Tony. I mean, what happens <laughs> so, when I go back? To are the you uh, okay? Or, uh, to the uh, friends or people on TV. <laughs> uh, are you recognized still when you return? Yes, they know me, and they keep yes. on asking me, "Why did you leave?" Uh, people just forget you for a while, but then when they see you, like I went last year, it was like they were so happy to have me there. I had a meeting with a couple of producers because we're just uh, we're thinking of bringing the. Uh, they are. They asked me to bring the the book to the screen. Uh, I am treated cordially. I said, are you okay? I'm treated correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, my family members, I mean, my family, like starting, uh, for example, my mother, when I sent her the book, she's like, the first thing she said, like, did you write about sex? That was the first 
think she said. And That's what uh, she was worried about. Did you write about yeah, sex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and I said, it's okay. You can just put the book away and it's okay not to, to read it. I accept it. And, and she said, how come you write about things about your life and your feelings, things that you had seen or felt? I said, I'm not going to write about Cinderella. I mean, yeah. it's okay. You can write your own book and you can do it your way. I'm rude. I'm not a very sane person. I'm telling you guys, I'm yeah. not a very nice person. So, but I'm welcome there from people that know me. I mean, uh, my friends, my makeup artist, my designer, um, my plastic surgeon, everybody, my friends, the producers, uh, the yeah. journalists, uh, they are very welcoming and they wanted this time for me to be on television, but I wasn't honestly ready to talk about the book. I yes. was a little bit scared, to be yeah. honest. I, I'm not trying to play the uh, the hero. So I was like, I don't know what the reaction of people would be. So I said, I could run back to Canada. I'm safer here. So yeah. <laughs> and do, because you, talks- do you feel that there would be retribution if you went on national TV in Lebanon and talked about your book? Yes. Wow. Yeah, but that's a bit scary. I think that now I am a little bit, I'm stronger now. Yes. And I feel more confident because yeah. of all the courage that people like you, like your listeners, like yeah. all the other hosts and all the people who are reading my book and yeah. having interest in the story. And even when they watch the trailer on YouTube, when they write yeah. masks, Natalie Restokian, N-A-T-A-L-A-Y, they will see, I mean, the viewers, I mean, it's been over 4,000 viewers. I mean, yeah. I feel like more confident. And the book yes. recently just became... Uh, in uh, United States, Washington, uh, yeah. among the 11 finalists um, uh, for Forward uh, Awards, Forward yeah, Reviews yeah. Award, and yeah. it's, it was 2,200 books, and I wrote the book in English, and yes. it is my fourth language. Yes. And uh, I say that if all this encouragement, all this appreciation is coming to my story, yeah. People will be there to protect me. The yes. Lord will be there to protect me. Yeah. And you guys believe in me and others will follow me. So I'm becoming yeah. stronger day by day, I think. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Um, for our listeners, I'm going to put um, Natalie's contact details um, in the chat box um, towards the end of the program. Um, but do you, the producers that you're still friends with um would they produce um a show for you in canada or would they still want you to do it in lebanon they wanted to bring the story to the um um to lebanon to this uh, yes. to as a movie and i did okay. not accept it i have a very good uh, two good friend producers but i did not yes. accept it because i said this story i wrote it and i want the world to know I wrote it for the West. Of course, I want them to to watch it, but yes. I want it to be done in Australia, in Canada, yes. in the States, in England, because it has to be, first of all, in English. And yes. people have to watch, and people have to see, and people have to live what we live. And because whatever we see on television in the series, I see it's like a very small portion of what goes on over there as yeah. female celebrities, as our life. And these kind of stories, they have to come to the screen as a series or a, as a movie in order to to bring more conscience and to let abusers over there be stopped. Because it's like, yes. for example, I'm just telling my pain to somebody who already knows the pain. So yeah. the West is very interested. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm hoping to make it uh, a movie in the yeah. West, and that's why uh, the only thing is that I think that some exterior uh, exterior um, uh, locations have to yeah. be worked on, and uh, it has to be worked on in Lebanon, not yes. in the States or Canada or Australia, wherever the production has to be, but I think it has to be a Western production, and uh, I have faith that it will be. Because and uh, you, now, do you think that it would be possible for to to be a Western production but filmed in Lebanon? Yes, I don't yeah. know. Anything is possible. I think that now Amazon. I want to thank Amazon um, yeah. because uh, two weeks ago they yeah. just uh, uh, signed a contract with me. 
yeah. audiobook. And my book is going to be exclusive audiobook uh, by Amazon. Amazon yeah. And it's going to be on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon ACX. And my producer and narrator for uh, uh, the audiobook, I, uh, we signed a contract uh, with uh, Nicole Rene. It's going yeah. to be out there in the end of November. So I think that the horizons are opening to me. I don't know. I think yeah. that things are coming easily. Like everything is coming into place Yes. And uh, it's it's so gratifying, and yeah. uh, I feel that uh, things are working in a very positive way more than I yeah. expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it it does sound like things are opening up for you, um, and I know that uh, masks is a wonderful read, uh, despite some of the dark topics um it's it's uh, quite it's well written and um you explore those dark topics in a way that has lovely storytelling ability so um i've just put your contact details up in the chat box for um the radio so that our listeners will be able to see where to contact you and follow you and buy the buy your book and um I'm just wondering, would you be, if you were talking about masks in Lebanon, would there be physical threats against your life, do you think? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you do talk about some rich and powerful men, I, I understand then. In Lebanon and Arab world, yes. All the names are changed, but I think that it yes. doesn't go to specific person it goes to yeah. the idea of the story itself because whatever i'm talking about yeah i mean it happens everywhere yeah and and yeah. And, and, and we all know that powerful men whoever they are like judges princes politicians everybody yeah. they are just trying to prevent us to have the positions that they do and they abuse women yeah. and it's it's happening everywhere but over there i think that uh, there might be risk on my life and there might not be i don't know but uh <laughs> congrats yes. somebody is saying congrats give hopes for the rest of us of course i give hope we all have to have hope and every time you know what makes me more hopeful in life you're gonna all of you laugh now i swear because yeah. now that my uh, uh my um my new publicist is uh, in, in yeah. England and I started uh, with Authorite and I'm starting my uh, uh, a blog tour and yeah. uh, one of the blog tours, they were asking me, what do you do when you're sad? And I said, when I'm sad, by the way, I have a very ugly voice, but I turn on YouTube and I put the song of hero, Maria yes. Carey, yes. and I sing it out loud with my ugly voice <laughs> and I cry, but I still sing. And because the words mean so much to me. And yes. I say that all of us have to have hope because we have a hero inside us and Everyone. we have to be there for each other. And I keep on yeah. saying when I'm not okay, I keep on saying I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. I will be not okay, by the way. Right? I mean, I will be crying. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it's, it's the feeling that you think that you're okay. It makes you okay. You just have to keep on repeating it to yourself. And yeah. it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a very strong person all the time. I, I yes, think I'm in some ways I'm strong, but uh, sometimes I just uh, cry. And when I'm sad, I just uh, put very red lipsticks on my lip at home. <laughs> and my husband comes home like, are you okay? You're sad today? Well, why do you have makeup? I say, I'm sad. He says, I know because you have red lipsticks. And, and the f <laughs> yeah. oh, That's and, pretty cute. Uh, yeah. That's a pretty cute story. Yeah. We have to ask him, <laughs> not me. So I have a lot of Things, weird things I do when I'm sad. And uh, like uh, I have to watch a very scary movie when I'm sad to forget yeah. what happened to me. Something scary because I'm, I became so senseless in life. I think that nothing is affecting me. So I have to oh. watch things with ghosts in order to be like <laughs> very scared. <laughs> oh my and, goodness. And, Don't you and, get scared yeah. though when you watch scary movies by yourself? My God, not at all. It's very uh -huh. funny. And, and, uh -huh. and the funnier part is that, and I just keep on trying to find something scarier and scarier. But oh uh, you know goodness. what I tell my husband? I say to my husband, 
Why am I not scared anymore? He says, you Lucifer, how are you going to be scared? That is so funny. This guy is the love of my life. Yeah, I don't know how he bears with me. I mean, I have, uh, I'm, I'm something. I mean, I'm, I've, I'm a whole package. I mean, I'm very yes. noisy. I'm very loud. I'm very hyper all the time. And I don't know how people love me. I don't even love myself most of the time. But I don't know. I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have them in my life. But uh, the, those are the things I do. And YouTube is very good for you. Trust me. When yeah. you are sad, just put karaoke and start yeah. singing songs like that inspire you. Like uh, yeah. one moment in time. A yeah. hero, that's my favorite, but yeah. I, I cannot compete with her voice. But we yeah. as women, I think that we have to know that we all deserve second chances. Yes, yes. We all deserve we, happiness. Yeah. And nobody has the right to judge us because no one has been in our shoe. And I do not give any permission to anybody to judge me because I judge myself. Yeah, I, I was just right. going to say, judging uh, judging yourself is um, oh. one of my faults as well. And yeah, I think your voice is lovely. Uh, no, um, they had to listen to me singing, then they would run away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but <laughs> not everyone. Funny like, part, I have your I <laughs> your speaking you. voice is, is very lovely, Natalia. And, for and, the radio, and, it's okay, but not for Maria Carey. I mean, run for your oh, life. Oh, well, and, no. And in front perhaps, of the mirror, I sing, by the perhaps way. Perhaps Mariah Carey has other issues that we don't know about. Exactly. I, I agree with that. But when it comes to voice and to that song, I mean, it says a lot to me. You know, when you know that dreams are hard to follow and they will always be naysayers to your choice in life. When I was yeah. marrying my husband and he had nothing, uh, you, they're saying you should not be so hard on so yourself. Hard on yourself. <laughs> you I know, agree. I think. That, Oh, so sweet. I love them. They're so amazing. Yes. Oh, listeners. Our listeners my are warm regards and cheers to you guys. I think that being hard on myself make me work on myself more. And yeah. I always try to work on myself and judge myself. And uh, besides having OCD, because I clean the same place over and over again. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and I okay. put my shoes by colors and, uh, you know, from darker to lighter. And uh, I do that in my wardrobe. I put my clothes by colors. Oh, my God. But you, don't, you just don't check if they're okay, right? I mean, at night, you just don't <laughs> go if you see all the doors are locked. And my husband, where are you? Just checking one second, honey. I'm coming. So it's like OCD. So I, I think that I just say to him, you know what? My I say to my husband, and his name is Nidal. In Arabic, it means fighter. I think he's a fighter because uh -huh. if he was in, I said to him once, I said, I think that if you lived in Jesus' century, they would have crucified you too. Seriously, <laughs> I mean, you're just burying all this with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about your life in Canada and this wonderful oh, husband oh, of yours. It, it, Oh, it's, it's very funny because when I came to Canada over there, like people know me, you know, when I go to the hairdresser, like, oh, she's here. She's a celebrity and everybody like pampering me and spoiling me. And I come yeah. here and uh, hello. Uh, yes. Would you like to have an appointment, please? Oh, my God. And they don't know me. In the beginning, it's very sad. I mean, just uh -huh. not being a public figure in a way, yes. that's painful, that part. So yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. That's very shocking. But comparing to other things that I have, yeah. it's fine. So, uh, and, and, and the thing is that we go, for example, uh, to shop in the begin at the beginning. Because at, yeah. the, at the last years of my life, I, I was having very good life. I, I cannot yeah. compare my life to stars in Hollywood, but I was yeah. doing very, I was having comfortable life. I had a driver, yeah. I had someone clean my house, etc., etc. So, what's it like having here? a driver? <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing because somebody like me, I think that uh, mm, it's good to have a driver. It's, it's good because uh, uh, so I'm you not a good driver. I'm guessing it would take away all that angst about where you've got to go. You've just... It's, Tell someone, pick me up at such and such and yeah, take and, me and to... Yeah, and we are still friends together, by the way. My driver yeah. is in Qatar and we're still friends. Uh -huh. And yeah, and, and he's very nice. It, it's good to have a driver. It's amazing because me, I have very... I'm a very bad driver. 
And, uh, and really? I'm even, yeah, I'm a very bad driver. Uh, today, for example, I had to go to the embassy, the Lebanese embassy, and I asked one of my friends to take me there. With the GPS, we got lost because we are worse than each other. So both of us. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I have uh, no orientation in, ro- in roads. So oh, that's, a, that's that. a thing. It's and directionally Canada, deficient. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and when I go here at the beginning, I go to shop with my husband. They stand in line, you know. I mean, why am I standing in line? I have to be there. My husband says, don't wear heels. Here, you don't wear heels. You're not going to a party. We're going to shop. We're going to Walmart, <laughs> you know, because I'm not used like that. He says, don't put those blinky ear- earrings. You don't put that. I'm like, oh, my God. I look like everybody to everybody else. I feel like an alien. So, and, and he says, before buying something, you look at the price. I'm like, what? You look at the price. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, it's so, so funny all, because... Yeah. All that has changed since moving to Canada. And yeah. and what about uh, the weather? Like, obviously... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very white. and um, But now I think that from the snow and because I don't see a lot of sun i mean i'm becoming like yellowish white you know pale like i'm fading oh (laughs) no i swear i mean like my husband like oh my god you should see some sun because we have to go on a vacation or something and uh uh, but for me when it's snow i don't drive so i'm all the time home uh Uh i love here i love canada because i'm somebody uh, i'm very loud person but i don't love to be in loud places it's very It's very weird, right? Because yeah. probably because of the life I lived, I don't like to be in crowded places. If I'm I'm somewhere where there's very loud music and singers, everything, my heart yeah. starts beating. I'm like, I want to go home. I want to go home. It's yeah. it's it's not me. So, uh, but it's very friendly here because people are so innocent and very nice and to me. And and with him, I love this guy. I mean, you know, yes. I don't know. I just. Hold his hand after 11 years, and and it's very funny because I'm like, you love me, right? Don't you love me? And like, you're like my lover. You're not my husband. The day that I feel you're my husband, I will leave you. And and out of nowhere, you know, like when we're watching a movie, wait, wait, I want to tell you something. He says, what again? You, you know, we'll be watching something. I just want to tell you I love you so much. I swear, I don't know how he bears with me. But I like cook, you know. I cook. Now I cook. I clean the house. And... If somebody comes to the house, I just clean. He says, don't do that. Wait till they go. But I think that for them, I'm like an alien. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Obviously, uh, he loves you very much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love him. Once they told me, yes. like they said to me, how come you love like this? I said, in life, when you see so much hatred yeah. and you go through so much pain, you will know the value of true love. Yeah. And that true love is above yeah. everything else. It's above yeah. money. It's above fame. It's about above power. It's like something you feel inside. And people say, yeah. there is no true love. I don't believe them. And yeah. I say one thing that I don't believe that you love with your heart. I say that you love with your soul. Because yes. the heart for me, it's an organ. Yeah. And it's your soul, you know. It's For example, I tell the other day, I told him, you know what, Nidal, if you want a kidney, I will give you one. Like, he said, <laughs> what? Why, why will I take your kidney? I said, no, no, I'm just telling you how much I love you. Okay, can we just continue the TV series? It just, things come into my head, you know, like, out of nowhere. <laughs> and because I'm a very, <laughs> I think I'm a very extreme person in everything. If I love, I love with all my heart. Yeah. But if I don't love, I hate I just walk away. And that's yeah. not good. But maybe life made me like this or I was made like this. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's how I write and that's how I feel yes. and that's how I live. And having my book masks out there and writing the second one and working yeah. to make it a TV series now. I just think that it's good to be your true self. And yeah, uh, definitely. It's, it's, and, 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 and people like my husband, like... Uh, uh, they have, they are gifts to us, you know. They are blessed yes. because they can bear with women like me. Though that's that's a good thing. I thank him so much to be in my life. And uh, yeah. like, uh, I think love is beautiful. And yeah. we don't have children, by the way. And uh, yeah. and I think that uh, 
we overcame a lot of problems together yeah. and uh, love just kept it's this a wonderful thing going. Thing. Love is, yeah. Do you want me to sing it? No, you don't want me to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to tell um, our listeners about your little trip to the embassy this oh, morning. Oh, today. Yeah, today, today I went to the uh, embassy because uh, the general consul, uh, Antoine Aid, uh, Tony, uh, my best yeah. regards to him, he wanted to meet me because he said that I am the first uh, Lebanese uh, female public figure in Canada whose yeah. book had been uh, in the 11th finalist in the world. I didn't know that. So uh, I went to see him, but I didn't know how to reach the embassy. So we put yeah. GPS and we went and he was very friendly. He was, he's very nice. And uh, we had a talk about the book and you should see, I mean, you could see the shock on his face when I'm speaking and uh, he, he's trying to, <laughs> he's trying to be okay. Like, okay. He said, what brought you here? I said, my lover. And he's, he's, he's an amazing personality, by the way. I wish that we have more like him in our yeah. embassies because he's he has such a nice personality and he's embracing the community, Lebanese. And yeah. uh, he just, uh, I, I, called, I told him that I need uh, the help of some producers, Canadian producers, if he knows to look at my book. And yeah. I'm not after the money or anything, but I just want my book to be on the screen, not yeah. because I want anything, just because I want the voices of other women and other things women that are to happening heard. to be yeah. heard, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. he made some calls, and um, I have wow. to email him. Yeah, and uh, that was very nice, and we took some pictures, and uh, and uh, he like uh, he was very like he said like everybody we all wear masks, and I said yeah, but some of us we just choose to wear masks. Some of us yeah. we wear because we are urged, and. Yeah. Uh, it was an amazing uh, visit, and uh, I'm doing my book launch in um, November, uh, September yeah. 10. Uh, sorry, yeah. September 10 here, and the Lebanese community people, like politicians, are uh, uh, they uh, they, uh, they are doing it for free, everything for me, and they have volunteered, and I thank them for that. We have a question here. Yeah. They say that uh, they are asking. Yeah. Do you have actors picked out that you would like to play your characters? I think that uh, uh, as long as it's story out there and we have a producer, I think that they will know the cast. Uh, if you just read the story, you would just imagine the, how they would be. But Joe, I think that I would like to have somebody who is like, uh, he has shaved head and a goatee. Yeah. Yeah. And Anna has to be... Uh, would like, you play uh, yourself? Out. No, no, I don't play. Would you because play Anna? No, no, no. I could play Anna. You know why? Because me, I'm 45, and Anna in the story, she's 30. So yeah. it wouldn't be yeah. fair. And yeah. uh, uh, and I think that I should give credit to people who really act so much more beautiful than I do. Now that I write, I think like that. And uh, you Anna are so itself, hard on yourself. Uh, I just live reality. Yeah, <laughs> because I cannot have everything in the world, so I have to make my choices. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I choose. I try to choose carefully. I make a lot of mistakes, eh? Especially <laughs> when I go to the market, like my husband, pick, choose which kind of coffee you want. I stand there for you know three, four minutes. Just get the coffee. But this one is new. Just get the coffee. This one is <laughs> just get. Just get both of them, please. We have to go. I'm tired. It's just a coffee, you know. <laughs> So I don't think that I can choose the characters, but I think when you read the story, the yeah. characters itself, I just uh, gave uh, the idea what kind of characters they they should play. But Anna, she should be loud, she should be hyper. And the mm. word Anna in Arabic means I am. It comes, the pronoun I am yeah. is in Arabic. Yeah. So that's why I named her Anna. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, a lot of people like, why did she choose Anna? All the names are they have meanings in the story. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but uh, I think that uh, I, would, I would give this book to any producer yeah. who would give life to the story in order yes. to bring justice and to, who, to who would uh, bring the story to life in the way that you see it right. coming to life. And I think that they will because... Uh, just like I'm working like with uh, Amazon now, exclusive for the audiobook with Nicole Renee, mm. and she's doing an amazing job because she's just 
she knows she loved the story and she has done um, many many books and uh but i think that uh i think that they will know what they're doing because if the story is successful they are successful too and i don't yeah. think that any producer wants to fail so i know that the book will be in uh, safe hands yeah 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 so let's talk just quickly about your passion for the me too movement yeah uh well i think that uh the story itself that I'm talking about is related a lot to Me Too movement mm -hmm. because I think we have to have Me Too movement over there, first yes. of all, in Lebanon, in the Middle East. Yes. And I I think that we have to have a We Move movement because it's we more than it's me. Yeah. Because it's all of us. And uh, regardless our abuse that we go through as women, and uh, I think that uh, it is amazing to have a movement like that. Yeah. And it's very funny that when I was writing the book, uh, the movement did not exist then. Uh -huh. And I sent the book to the editor mm -hmm. and David calls me. He says, oh, my God, this story is related to me to movement. I said, excuse yeah. me, what movement? It was very new to movement I went to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> last year. And um, I think that uh, for me, it has to uh, the it is it's it's happening everywhere and um, yeah and it's spanning uh, Lebanon, the Arab world, yeah. United States, and yeah. and it is it is like initially uh, internalizes my story and the idea of me too women it has to be everywhere and and people should stop saying that women why they are coming forth if they didn't they would say they're keeping it a secret yeah if they come forward after years why they are coming forth now if they never did they will just suffer with that what do they want from us i just want to yeah. ask out there i mean yeah. seriously do you think that it's easy to come forth it's hard I absolutely mean, hard it's very hard for us to come forward and say i have been raped i've been i have been sexually abused and we have to keep that secret and etc etc and i am with the me too movement and we have to have a me too movement in lebanon yes. we have and yes. who joins it and what happens to the women who are joining in the beginning i don't know but yeah. i just think that it will be risky but yeah. uh i hope i give the answer uh, uh yeah, no answer I, I, question I think it's important that we keep talking about the Me Too movement and the ideas behind that movement, that women should be able to come out and speak and talk of their uh, trauma because both you and I know that by talking about the trauma, that starts the healing process and exactly. we all need healing from those sorts of things, those of us that have suffered uh, any sort of uh, sexual Abuse. trauma. Um, exactly. You need to because, heal. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is that I don't know why they attack women this way. And I don't know yeah. why they just think that they need fame. I, I would say that those women who are just coming forth and talking about their pain, they are talking about their pain. They would have hundreds of thousands of kinds of excuses, especially that they have social media, to be yeah. famous. So they yeah. don't need to talk about their pain in order no. to come forth. No. And, and that is so unfair. Yes. And that is something inhumane to talk like it that. Yes. And it's undignified to talk like that about women. And Absolutely. that's very sad when we see people like saying, oh, she's doing that in order to seek fame. She's not doing that to seek fame. Yeah. She's that, talking about her pain. She's yeah. talking about things that she And you don't talk about being, your pain to get fame. Yes, exactly. You have other social media. You can do anything now <laughs> on social yeah. media and be famous. You yeah. have YouTube. I mean, and, and, it's, and even when they're talking about, we are talking about our pain as Me Too movement, and yeah. they're still just persecuting us. Yes. And I think that if they give us, they give women a chance in different aspects in the well, world, mostly the world women will be just a better want to place. be 
you just you, the only re for a lot of women the only reason you talk about those sorts of trauma is to be heard it's not about fame fortune or money it's just to be heard that someone listens to your story and has empathy sympathy and understanding and that's enough for many 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 women isn't it exactly and plus it will just stop other abusers to think to twice doing that exactly yeah. because once things come forth openly spoken yeah others will think twice before doing moves yeah. like that how do we yeah. stop abusers by talking openly about it yeah when when yeah. we keep on hiding it they will keep on doing it because yeah. everything which is hidden we it are either know secret. that it's wrong secret and fear yeah. these yeah. three things and now i think that it is our time as women and yeah. we are creating our power on the pillars of our pain yeah. on pillars of our conscience yes. and we're saying no more yeah. so at least we should be united and they should let us be united and yeah. this unification is the most important thing that we have around the world and that's why in my book masks i talk about different things that a lot of people will not i just say man if you're just very dominant don't read my book <laughs> don't <laughs> it's not for men my book is not for men not at all But i don't it's advise anyone definitely any for all our women read. listeners out there yes no man allowed i mean i don't <laughs> think they will like it honestly and they would not love it they had to be like a very understanding very uh emotionally mature emotion. exactly like david david is 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 the first one my my, my editor that i work with yes. he he like loved the story he said i'm yes. so happy and proud i said how come you you're a man yeah <laughs> he said yeah, i'm a man but but he's like he's british and he's like a very open minded person and uh, he um understood what i'm talking about and yeah. but not every man they could not grasp the idea as it is so the story is not for them but i'm sure that it has nothing to do with all the abuse the way of the abuse that happened i mean uh, i was talking to my narrator nicole rene the producer for the audiobook mm. she says i reached the, this chapter that anna was peeing in a can yeah. and i said yes yeah. she's like it's very shocking i yeah. said really go on she's like oh my god it's very shocking and i said yeah because a lot of things happen that they don't know about they think that Yeah. abuse it, it's it's not only the abuse it's suffering and yeah. things that you go through the civil war you do not have shower for days and yeah. you live with rats underground in a basement with candles yeah. we have no food except bread and uh, some canned meat uh, we've been through a lot i've lived that life yeah. uh, this the civil war so uh, it's not about being a hero i'm just somebody who had the chance and wrote it And, and had the courage how did the thousands of it. us exactly they have been living that and still are there but i think that they didn't get the chance or did not decide to write about it but yeah. uh, it just uh, shows to the rest of the world uh, that uh, women everywhere are uh, so alike but our experience over there is so much different than yours because yes. uh, there are not a lot of ears Yeah. Food sense to our voices. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are almost out of time, but before I let you go, Nat, I just want to know what is your message for our listeners today? I want to thank all the listeners. I want to thank you a lot, Tony, for this wonderful uh uh show. I'm very honored to be with you and uh it's my and pleasure thank you rebel and i want to say to you women out there be brave be yourself don't give up you deserve happiness yeah and the most important message for me from me to you is to believe in yourself when you believe in yourself even yeah. don't don't think about age when you believe in yourself your dreams come true and yeah. no one can crush you except you Don't yeah. let anybody crush you because when you believe in yourself 
anything can happen. If yeah. I have written a book in my fourth language, which is yes. accepted by Amazon to be an audiobook, and in the 11 in the world in Washington, United States, finalist, yes. you can do anything. That's right. That's a wonderful message to bring to our listeners at the close of our interview today is that um, reminding everyone that you can do anything. Be brave. So be brave and you can do anything. Now, um, for those listeners, I've put uh, Natalie's uh contact details and where you can get a book and look at her YouTube, her Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter um, and her website and that's all in our chat box. Um, I am so grateful to have met, well I haven't, we haven't actually met in person but we've met and talked quite a lot um, since we first contacted and connected with each other back in, gosh, March, I think it was. Um, and um, I so appreciate you joining Radio Tony this week. Um, and I'm sure the listeners have had a wonderful time listening to um, you talking about your life and in particular your wonderful book, Masks. So I'm going to throw to Rebel for a quick break. Um, thank you once again, again <laughs> Natalie. I will thank um, you and thank you all the listeners. You've been amazing, all of you, just following and asking questions. And thank you, thank you so much. And big hugs from Canada to Australia to you yes. and to Rebel and everybody out there. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm sure I'll talk to you again soon. Um, we'll just have a quick break break listeners and when I come back I'll tell you about next week's show. Over to you Rebel. And you're back on Radio Tony with Tony Lontis. Just quickly before we run out of time I wanted to let you know that next week I'm talking to another author, Jennifer Irwin. She's from the New York and this is what she says about her book. I came up with the idea to write Address the Colour of the Sky when I was the, in the midst of a divorce from a man I'd been married to for 19 years. There was a tremendous sense of failure brewing inside her. She yearned for an outlet to deal with the pain of a situation and come to grips with the fact that she'd failed at the most important commitment in her life. The combination of pain of a marriage and a fascination with the details of other people's lives created a perfect storm for me to write my debut novel. I was curious as to why some women chose the right partner and stayed married forever, and some don't. I wondered if there was a correlation between my childhood and the image I have painted in my mind as a perfect partner for me. There was no doubt that my idea of what a husband and father looked like was skewed. My mother had been married three times. My father, four. By husband number three, it became apparent that my mother's man-picking was broken. One of the men she married was extremely abusive, which caused me severe childhood trauma. Another factor also came into play. I'm the child of an alcoholic drug addict. Although my mother was my primary caregiver, my birth father, um, birth father's addiction took a toll on me during my childhood. When I was dating my now ex-husband, I had been given the signs that he may have had a drinking problem. I didn't listen to the pointers. So after a year of working on her manuscript, she sent her oldest son off to college um, and there were quite a few things and news about the rise of incidents of date rape on college campuses. Um, Jennifer wondered about our society and where we were going wrong. Why was a drunk girl raped instead of being taken care of? What could we do about the binge drinking problem and the breakdown of the tried and true buddy system? These were minor factors in her book, but something she wanted to address. She takes the role of being a mother of three sons very seriously, and it's important for her that they deeply respect women. They were primarily primarily raised by Jennifer, 
and a few years into writing Dress the Colour of the Sky, the Sudansky trial was all over the news. Um, She struggled with why we hadn't better protected these kids. And then the gymnasts who'd been sexually assaulted by their trusted team physician. All of this forced Jennifer to take a deep look into her childhood. There was part of her that wondered from the traumatic incidents what impact they had had on her life. She knew if she didn't dig dig deep, seek help, read other books and face her demons, she would have yet another unhealthy, healthy relationship. What she found since releasing her book is that she's not alone. Shortly her book shortly after her book was released, Kelly Oxford treated her tweeted about her sexual assault story. She opened up the lines of communication for other women to share their traumatic stories. So listeners, our Talk next week will be with Jennifer Irwin, who has published this amazing book, The Car- that Address the Colour of the Sky. Thank you so much for listening this week. I love that you interact with us, and I appreciate you listening. Until next week, this is Tony, over and out.